Welcome to another episode of Culture Cast with Dustin Homan. Dustin Homan is going to be interviewing uh, Deanna Langenkamp. Deanna is a second year student at the Ohio State University enrolled in animal si sciences, and she's going to be talking about her recent trip to Costa Rica. So stay tuned. Again, my name is Dustin Holman. I work for 4-H Youth Development as part of the Ohio State University Extension in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. And with me today is my esteemed guest, Deanna Langenkamp. Deanna is a second year, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Should know this by now. Majoring in animal sciences with minors in ag communication as well as a dairy certificate. Deanna, welcome to Culture Cast again. <laughs> So Deanna and I actually recorded this a couple months ago, and we had some issues with the internet, um, and it, it produced quite a very funky video. So we're going to do it again, and hopefully the second take is even better. But as, before we delve into this, Deanna, tell uh, our viewers a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? How did you get to Ohio State? Um, I grew up in West Central Ohio in a small town called St. Henry. Um, I was involved in 4-H and FFA throughout high school, um, especially in like the dairy cattle sphere. So. And then how did you choose Ohio State? Um, I have been a Buckeye for like as long as I can remember, like was born into my who I am, I guess. It's in your blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like the obvious choice for me. Wonderful. <laughs> So for those of you that haven't joined us before, CultureCast is a monthly uh, video cast that we, re we record and we invite students here from in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental St Sciences, and sometimes students outside of Ohio State uh, to tell us about experiences that they have taken, uh, trips that they have taken outside of the United States. So. We, our hope is that by you tuning in for about 30 minutes, you get a little bit of a taste of a different culture. You hear uh, the story of someone, um, on, and oftentimes people who have not been outside the United States, and Deanna will tell us about that here in just a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, we hope that if you watch enough of these, it'll inspire you to want to take your own trip abroad. So as I mentioned earlier, we are going to focus on Nicaragua today. It's a country located in Central America, as you see here on the map, uh, a place that's much warmer than it is up here. When you went on, went down there, Deanna, uh, what time of the year was it? Uh, it was the middle of December here. Here, yeah. okay. And then when you stepped off a plane in Managua, which is the capital, what was the weather like there? It was hot and humid and gorgeous. And wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a culture shock coming back, I feel like, from a place like mm. that, uh, even though you've lived here all your life. So, Danny, you grew up um, Dark County, mm -hmm. right? And tell us about and where you had been, you know, the furthest place that you had been to before taking this trip. Yeah. Um, so for 18, 19 years, really, I had lived in my little Ohio, Indiana sphere. I'd been to Florida once to visit some family, but other than that, I really haven't traveled much. So, so what prompted you to want to bust that bubble and take a trip to Nicaragua? Yeah, um, I think it was like already transitioning into like the whole college idea of things. So it's already taking like a big step there. And then whenever I came to Ohio State for orientation during the summer, they um, were promoting this first year experience. Um, and I had no idea where we were going. They said it was out of the country and somewhere warm and I was all for it. So yeah. it didn't even matter what country, nope. just <laughs> get me out and it's warm. Yeah. And uh, our study abroad programs are such a, an incredible opportunity, not only through Ohio State, but through other colleges. Um, as Deanna is, is, is telling you, for an opportunity for you to be under the guidance of people who have been to these countries, they know what's going on, you can feel comfortable there. How long were you there? 10 days. For about 10 days uh, over winter break. So Nicaragua, let me provide a little bit of background and then we're gonna get to the meat of our show, which you all are waiting uh, to, to see, and that's some photos and also to hear some stories uh, from Deanna's trip. 
So Nicaragua, as you can see here um, on your screen, is a country of about 6 million people. So it's about the same size as the state of Maryland in terms of population. Geographically, it's about the size of our neighbors, Pennsylvania. So that can kind of put things in perspective for you. Uh, previously, Nicaragua was both a Spanish and a British colony before gaining its independence. And two of its largest industries are textiles, clothing. So if you've ever, uh, next time you're, you're putting on clothes, take a look at the tag. Uh, there may be, you may find that some of the clothes that you're wearing come from Nicaragua, as well as the agriculture. Specifically within the agriculture industry, beef and coffee. And Deanna's gonna show us some, some photos of what that process uh, is like. So Nicaragua, we always like to show the flag on our program as well. This is the flag of Nicaragua, the blue uh, stripes on either side representing the oceans that straddle either side of Nicaragua. You'll see there in the middle, Republica de Nicaragua. So viewers can probably guess which language they speak, but Deanna, what language do they speak down Spanish. there? Spanish. And how is your Spanish when you went down? Very limited. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take it in school? Yes, I took okay. three years of Spanish in high school and it really didn't help much, so. You knew like bathroom, water, yeah. right, food. Colors, that's about it. <laughs> I could speak to the little kids. That's about as far as my communication skills went. So on that subject, as you were there, did you find that your language proficiency increased by just being there? And yeah, um, I became more comfortable using, like because I took so many like years of um, high school Spanish, like I knew the words, I just wasn't confident using them. And so just being around the language, I think helped me like become more confident in using it too. Um, yeah. And you say specifically with the little kids. Yes. Why? Um, it was, I guess I didn't think that they were like going to pick up on my accent and be like, oh, she doesn't actually know what she's talking about. They were fine just talking about like the colors and the animals as we were like coloring in the coloring books and stuff we brought, so. So it was a good way for you to learn some of these basic skills and not feel judged, yeah. right? Or excuse me, some of the basic words and probably not feel judged because kids don't care. Yeah. Right? They're just excited that you're around there. And I did have one of the older little girls in our homestay. I was trying to say chicken and I couldn't figure out the word and she just like rolled her eyes at me. I'm like, <laughs> I know. I know. And in that instance, you just, you can't be upset about it either. No. Right? You just, you go with it and you know sometimes you're going to be wrong and that's okay. <laughs> so the flag of Nicaragua you see here, let's get into the, the fun part of Culture Cast, and that's photos that our guests take. So Deanna, first of all, tell us what we see here. These are coffee berries. Um, so like one of the main industries in Nicaragua is the coffee industry. Mm -hmm. um, and during our homestay, we stayed in like a community, a, a cooperative community in which they were basically based off of um, the coffee industry and coffee farming. And so while we were there, they had us go out in the fields and they let us help harvest the coffee berries. Um, and all the berries have to be harvested by hand. It's a very um, slow, tedious, and gentle process because if you harm the, the coffee trees, um, they don't produce again. And so you have to be very careful about what you're doing. Um, and actually, as you can see, I'm not very good at harvesting <laughs> coffee because you want the berries to be the dark, rich red color there. And mine have a lot of green on them. So, so. keep your day job yeah. is the moral of the story here. <laughs> when you say trees, are we talking, like, tell me about the height of these trees. Okay. Um, they're more like tall bushes. Okay. Um, I think the tallest ones we saw were about as tall as me, like five foot. So you were able so. to just, I mean keeping your feet on the ground. Yeah. You need to be in like a boom or a ladder in order to harvest these. And do, do each of the beans grow separately or do they kind of grow like grapes in a bunch? Um, They're like groups of like two or three. Like it's not a big bunch, but yeah. So some of these beans that aren't uh, quite as red as the others, would the farmers leave those on yes. typically until they've matured? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you collect these, you put them in your basket or whatever vessel you have. And then what happens? So um, actually in between these steps, there's uh, another step. Um, it's called um, like water washing the coffee berries. Um, so basically this separates the red berry part from the coffee bean. Um, and yeah, they just rush like lots and lots of water over it and it separates it. 
So that's, it separates the red part that you see here off of the bean yes, that, right. that we see here in this photo. And did they do anything with that red fleshy part after they've washed it off? Yeah, um, in the cooperative that we were staying with, they did a really neat um, process with the, the waste from like the water washing. Um, so what they do is they take the red or the red berry part of it and they put it in a biodigester mm -hmm. and then the berries ferment and they collect the gas nets what they use to power their homes. Fascinating. And it's interesting to hear you say that because you know, here at Ohio State and other universities, we're trying to get more people to use these digesters as a, a renewable energy source. And you go down to Nicaragua and they're already using it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just something that's, um, I, so it goes to show that we can learn as much from other cultures as maybe they could learn from us too. So back to the bean, coffee beans. We've washed off the red fleshy part and we've got these beans now, but they do not look like the beans that I grind in the morning. What changes? Um, so after the coffee, the cherry part, the berry part of the coffee bean is washed off, um, they're laid out to dry for about a week or so until um, there's an envelope on the outside of the coffee bean. And once that's dry enough to dry enough to crumble off in your hand, um, that's whenever they know that it's ready to go on to the next step. Okay. Um, but these coffee beans right now are just laid out on tarps under the sun and they just let the sun do its work and dry out these coffee beans. Are the beans still green when they're packaged and shipped off? Yes. Okay. Well, they're at this plant, Soul Cafe, where this picture was taken. Um, they were still the coffee beans were still green, and then they're sent off to another processing plant after that. Okay, to be roasted mm -hmm. into the kind of black bean uh, that were typical that we're used to. Anyone who enjoys coffee will know Nicaraguan coffee is a very prized coffee. People pay a lot of money uh, to be able to drink Nicaraguan coffee. I think it's really cool that you got to be there and actually got to participate yeah. in a little bit of this. But your coffee experience was not done. Tell us about what we're seeing here. Um, so this is the taste testing portion of it. They do quality control at Soul Cafe where we were visiting. Um, and so basically what they did is they gave us all spoons and what you did is you went around to each of the cups on the table and you just took a spoonful of the coffee and you would slurp it off and then you weren't actually allowed to drink the coffee you had to spit it into those uh, metal tubs down on the floor there and yeah all oh, this so the ones look like the hourglass down yeah. here at the bottom those okay are just spit collecting devices okay. yeah it was when you, as you're talking about this i'm thinking man the tasters have to be like extremely energized all day mm -hmm. if, if they're ingesting it, but they don't actually do that. No. So is there anything that you do with, you're supposed to do with the coffee? Are you supposed to swirl it around or anything like yeah. that? If you slurp the coffee right, you're, it's supposed to hit like all parts of your tongue. Okay. And so. Could you taste the difference in these? Some of them, yes. Some of them definitely tasted like dirt and other ones <laughs> tasted a lot better. So. And are the ones that are yeah, you say tasted like dirt. Were they roasted differently, or why? What, did, what was the difference in the taste? Um, the main difference in these coffees was that, like, where they were grown. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on what's like grown in the same field as the coffees depends, like, what the taste is. Okay. Yeah. Back to the coffee trees. So when I think about you know agriculture here, we think about corn planted in rows. How were the trees laid out on these farms that you visited? Um, they were still planted in rows, um, very organized plots. And okay. And were, was it on flat ground? Was it on hilly ground? What did the terrain look like when they were grown? Yeah, well, most of the country um, is hills and mountainous area. And so the coffee um, the coffee trees were planted on some pretty steep hills that we wouldn't be able to grow like coffee or, or corn or beans on. Okay. So good use of landscapes that can't grow other crops. You can use them to grow coffee. So you've seen this whole process and ultimately that coffee, um, I'm gonna skip ahead here, ends up in a cup, many of us for breakfast. So this is a scene from breakfast, mm -hmm. right? So tell us a little bit about your, uh, a normal breakfast in Nicaragua. What do we see here? Yeah, um, so we always had fresh fruit, which if you've never been to like a Central American country and had some fresh local grown fruit, you're really missing out because I, you can't even compare it to anything that you get here in like the States because it was just that amazing. Um, so you have your fresh fruit that we always have. 
Um, and then the rice and beans that's on the lower, like the brown mushy stuff in the lower left-hand corner. Um, that was with basically every meal that we had in Nicaragua, and it was really good. So I see pineapple. Mm -hmm. And then are there two types of eggs? Yes. Well? So you have like a scrambled and then a sunny side up. And then there's this like hunk of... Looks like sour cream or something. It was fresh it? cheese. Mm. Yeah. And did it crumble? So like a yeah, like a it was kind of spongy too. Okay. I don't know. It was very fresh, like home homemade cheese. So that was a neat experience. And then I assume this is a tortilla. Uh, it's actually a pancake, but tortilla. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had tortillas with like every other meal. So is that pancake? Was it sweet? Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And most of this, I'm sure, is probably fresh local handmade yep like you were saying about the fruit it's hard to compare and the juice in my meal i think it was a guava passion fruit juice it okay. looks delicious so you mentioned the rice and beans uh, kind of being a staple were there other staple foods that at, at most meals you would find yourself eating um so the rice and beans and then tortillas um it wasn't, we didn't always have like a source of meat because uh, especially in like our homestay, like that's a pretty expensive, like special uh, meal. And so they do a lot of like the rice and beans for protein. Um, we typically had like eggs as well. Okay. Things like that. We're going to go ahead and skip back now um, along the same thread of agriculture. So you saw a little bit about the coffee. I also mentioned uh, that, that cattle, specifically beef, but cattle is also a big part of the agriculture industry in Nicaragua. So tell us about what we're seeing here in this photo, Deanna. So this photo was taken at one of the dairy farms that we visited. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of the terrain in Nicaragua is either like steep hills or mountains. And so while you can't exactly plant crops um, on like this land, what they do a lot of times is they put livestock on it and you're still like harvesting the energy and things by like grazing your animals on the land. Um, you're just not using it to make or to grow crops. And now they, as you were talking, I can see what one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven cows. They mm -hmm. kind of blend in, but you can see them here. And then obviously you have that natural source of water for them as well. So a good use of the terrain like Deanna mentioned. And uh, as Deanna mentioned, she's uh, she is a dairy girl, and she got very excited when she found uh, a Holstein. Yeah. Did you see many of these Holsteins uh, down there? So I was actually surprised by how many like Holstein Jersey cows that we saw. Hmm. Um, through some personal research, I was expecting more like of a like Holstein Brahmin cross, just because the dual purpose was. Um, more versatile for the people down there. Um, but I actually saw a lot of just like dairy cows, which was really, really exciting. So tell our viewers, for those that don't know about dairy cattle, wh why would you, were you assuming that you were going to see some cattle that were bred with the Brahmin breed? Yeah. Um, so the Brahmin breed of cattle is um, a lot more, they're used to the heat a little bit more. Um, so they would do better in like that kind of a climate down there. And so whenever you would cross the two breeds, you would still get a high producing cow, like milk wise, um, but also the Brahmin would add um, a better like carcass as well to harvest at like the end of the animal's life. And then it would be able to withstand the heat a little bit better as well. Holsteins. So mm -hmm. again, for, for those of us that don't know a lot about these breeds, how do you know it's a Holstein cow? Um, so it's white with black spots. Like the one that you're seeing. <laughs> yep. And then you also said Jersey. So tell us about what does a Jersey look like? Um, a Jersey, um, it's going to be like a brown cow and it's going to be more angular. Like you're going to be able to see its hip bones and things. And that's really how you tell that um, a cow is a dairy cow versus like a beef cow is if like you, you can see like they're made, they're used for milk production and not so much meat production. So then you can, you're supposed to be able to see more of their joints and things because they're bred to use their um, nutritional qualities and stuff. Like with the food that they eat is supposed to be put into the milk and not to put um, weight on. So I should have made this disclaimer at the beginning that um, Deanna is one of our student assistants that works here at the 4-H Center, and she helped us with the Ohio State Fair last year. And specifically, she helped us with the Dairy Skillathon because of her experience and knowledge, as you're getting a little piece of here. Um, so it's I just love this photo because I think it encapsulates 
her personality, which you're not seeing uh, fully through this video, the short video that we have, uh, but just also her love and her knowledge of the industry. You were just talking before this that she did a Facebook Live video from the Dark County Fair um, telling people about the dairy industry, and she got hundreds, a thousand, over a thousand <laughs> views. So I'm hoping that she brings that to Culture Cast as well. So you've seen a little bit about the agriculture, and uh, I, I'd like Dan to tell us a little bit about life in Nicaragua. So what do, what do we see here? Um, this picture was taken during our homestay. Um, so we spent two nights, three days with a family in like this cooperative farming community. Um, and they were so giving up what they had. They had three, yeah, three bedrooms in this house and probably about 12 people that normally sleep in those bedrooms. And they gave my friend Amanda pictured here and I um, one of the rooms and two of the beds actually. And so they were just really, really kind and generous in all that they did. Um, but you can see like the, the pink and the green in like the bottom right hand corner, um, those are mosquito nets. And so it's a very warm, um, humid climate. And so there's bugs everywhere. Like I think after the first night in our homestay, I counted 52 bug bites. And I'm on you. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> like I'm like 90 percent sure I got Zika, but it's fine. <laughs> we survived. Um, yeah. And so this was our, during our homestay. If Deanna's mother is watching this video right now, <laughs> she's fine. And she's okay. looking forward to going on another study abroad sometime, yeah. right? She's, she's feeling good. But yeah, so this is not something, you know, we deal with mosquitoes here in Ohio in the in the summer. But as you were saying, when it, you maintain that tropical, uh, tropical weather all year long, you get mosquitoes throughout the year. So... Um, this is one of the precautions uh, that they take. I also see that they apparently decorated for Christmas for yeah. you a little bit with some poinsettias <laughs> in the background. So describe for us a little bit about this home. You said 12 people live in it. Mm -hmm. um, does it look like a home in the U.S.? Uh, no, not at all. Um, so our host mom, mom, her name was Maria Jesus, and she was, she was an older woman. She had uh, three grandchildren that stayed with her in the house as well as her four children. Um, so the entire family was just around all the time. Um, and the house itself was um, very humbling and very simple. Um, you can see they have like the poinsettia um, tablecloth up on the walls, but behind it, it's just wood slats. Um, and that was the whole house. The floor was the same. There was no like paint or carpet or anything. It was just very simple. Um, and the kitchen was a little bit separate from the other three or four rooms in the house. And actually, we would sit in the room, like, at the little kitchen table that they had. And, like, wow, Maria Jesus was making us, like, breakfast and lunch. And the pigs and chickens would just walk on through. Like, it was just, it was a weird experience. It was an incredible experience. Did they have indoor plumbing at this house as no. well? Nope, we had an outhouse. <laughs> so just, I mean, similar to what, you know, the same kind of development that the U.S. went through, um, you know, in the early 1900s, we see in a lot of these countries, too, as they, they too, are beginning to, to develop. So you mentioned uh, some of the kiddos that you got to yeah. hang out with, and you'll see them here on the screen. Tell us about your time with them. Um, we had a lot of fun with the little girls that were in the house. Um, I couldn't speak very much Spanish, and uh, Amanda... She could speak a little bit more, but neither of us were very, very proficient at all. Um, and so we just connected a little bit better with the girls who were fine with us, just like <laughs> laughing at them and having fun. Um, and so yeah, this picture actually, they were playing on my phone on Snapchat and they loved the Snapchat filters. So yeah. Tell uh, the viewers a little bit about, um, a little bit more about uh, the people there. And you said that they were very gracious. Uh, did you find that everywhere that you went? Yeah, um, everywhere, everywhere we went, like, the people were just so giving of all that they had. Um, it's been, like, in the homestay especially, but, like, around the country, like, you, you could tell that people just, they were living a simpler lifestyle than what we were used to, um, but they wanted to give of what they had, and they wanted to, like, um, explain their knowledge and help teach us what they're about and what their culture is, um, and they were just really, really kind. So our final few photos uh, are of the landscapes that, and some of the places that you got to visit. So tell the viewers about what they're seeing here. Yeah, um, this was one of the first places that we visited in Nicaragua. 
Um, it was just off the side of the road. It wasn't near a big city or anything, but it was a beautiful waterfall that we got to go visit. Um, and there's actually a really rich story that goes along with it. Um, we stumbled across the manager of this um, waterfall national park right as we were leaving, um, and he told us this beautiful story. Um, so basically, there was a tribe that used to live in this area, and the chief's daughter um, fell in love with some like low-life tribesmen, and her dad was like, no, like that's not going to happen. And so after a few incidents where um, the chief kept like telling his daughter like no you can't be with that man um he sentenced the young man to uh, he was going to send him away and so the night before he was supposed to be sent away um the young couple stood at the top of the rock here before there was a waterfall and they jumped off the side and as they fell the waterfall started flowing oh wow yeah. that's beautiful did you get to swim here uh, no, we did not. Just view it. I mean, viewing it is plenty. Yeah. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I presume this is a sunset yes. photo that you took. So tell us where you were when this happened. Yeah, this was during our homestay um, at Peñas Blancas, which means White Mountain. Um, and actually, it's on the opposite side from this picture there. But there was a white like rock face on the mountain, which is what um, they named the area after. But it was just scenes like this that you saw every like everywhere you went in Nicaragua. It was the lush greenery and the vibrant colors in the sky. It was just gorgeous. And again, tell uh, this is kind of an, an interesting place yeah. where you were, and you did get a swim here, mm -hmm. right? So tell the viewers about the landscape here. Um, so this is actually a dormant volcano crater, um, which filled with water, and we got to go swimming here and things and. This was near um, the capital city, Manawa. Yeah. Manawa. Ma yeah. yeah. So, Deanna, as we're wrapping up our time, uh, one thing I always like to ask people is, what would you tell our viewers as to why they should visit Nicaragua? Um, visiting Nicaragua was truly an eye-opening experience for me. Um, coming off of finals week last December and then coming back to Christmas, it was just really eye-opening to see that, um, you know, the things that are troubling me can be so much different for, like, somebody else living, you know, like, hours south of me, you know? And so um, just, like, being immersed in that culture and realizing that, you know, there are people that they live a simpler life and they seem so happy with what they have. It's just truly eye-opening, and I think that's a wonderful experience that I was able to experience. It's a, a perspective change, yeah. right? And something that um, you probably wouldn't have been able to fully embrace and encounter from just reading a book or watching a movie. I mm -hmm. mean, you had to be there. You had to live it. You had to breathe it. You had to eat it. Um, I want to take just the last few t uh, minutes that we have here, and Deanna's uh, trip makes a nice transition into a partnership that we are working on here at 4-H with 4-H down in Nicaragua. So um, here at OSU, it's not just about the study abroad that we try to uh, create opportunities for cultural exchange, but we're trying to do that in all of our programming. And that's why I wore my hat today. As you can see here, uh, it's a hat that from the organization we're working with called Fabretto. They are a nonprofit that runs 4-H down in Nicaragua. They don't call it 4-H there, they call it Cuatro S's, which is 4S. If you take head, heart, hands, and health, our four H's, and translate them into Spanish, you roughly get four words that begin with S. Uh, saber, uh, sentimientos, hands is servicio, and health is salud. So cuatro essays. And one uh, unique project that they do down there is one that you've already learned about from Deanna, is they grow coffee as part of their 4-H project. And one we've been doing, what we've been doing with them is they grow coffee, partially uh, in part by Cuatro Essays members down in Nicaragua. They ship it up here to the U.S. We put a custom label on it that talks a little bit about our partnership. And then we have some 4-H clubs here in Ohio who are selling this premium coffee as a fundraiser. So they're earning money, but then they're also supporting entrepreneurs back in Nicaragua. 
I guess you could say that's our, our little commercial that helps to pay for culture cast, but it's a really unique opportunity. And we look to create these experiences really across the lifespan to engage youth very young and, and as well as young adults like Deanna. So Deanna, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, I should say gracias. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to all of our viewers joining us next time, next month's culture cast. Thank you for tuning in.